Well, for now, right? Wait, for now, I remember you should be in Connecticut. Um, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, so welcome to the day. Good to have you with us this morning. My sister. Oh, it's the night, it's an old bridge. And you remember you should be in Connecticut. And you live in old bridge. That's a long trip. It's close to here. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. So my sister over here. Can you guys read that? Michelle? All right. Welcome, my sister. Thanks for being here. I'm not too far. Let's go close to you. Right in here. Oh, I haven't heard that name in a long time. Look at my sister. And last but not least, get you, my sister, look at her. All right, welcome, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, and those who are live are watching us, this is the first time. Welcome, all the way. Okay. I think I've covered that part, right? Okay. All right, at this time we're going to do an offering. Um, I'm going to ask you, we can do the next question and so forth to make ready. They will be collected from the rear coming to the front. And also, yes, um, you may see a couple of the younger people following behind the message as they collect. This is how I was going to ask you. They're collecting um, funds for their trip coming up soon. So, Please
Let's go. Let's go. We have to do what we did not. Let's go to the new place. Let's go to the new place. Let's all go to the new place. Let's 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 go to the new place. I'm going to ask the children to come forward for their children's story. And I think our children's story tell us this morning who will be the president. The president will tell us the story today. And you'll find out who the president is. So you're going to take a seat and come back. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Would anyone like to pray to start, start the lesson? Remember the theme for this month? Anyone else? The theme for this theme. Good answer, but the theme is false. The leaves in autumn are they show vibrant the colors of red, orange, yellow, and gold. These leaves have been waiting to show us the magnificent colors. The new thing is, these colors were present all along. And there's a billion waiting in each of us too. Ready to be bread and bread. See, today we can, we can choose to show Jesus in our attitude, the things we say and the things we do. When we choose to live for God, we become beautiful beacons of God's love to other people. How could you show Jesus in your attitude? Good answer. Let's all see the morning for today. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that you may see your good work and your Father in heaven. 
give glory to your Father. Amen. Matthew 5, verse 6. Answer the answer. Make a list of things you can do to share God's wealth with your family and friends. What can you can you make and put God first and follow Jesus? Going to church every Saturday when you don't think. Reading the Bible, yes, doing God's work. And praying in the evening. Great. What is one thing you can do on each of these three things? Here in mind, you can do the same thing. to pray for any session. Let's do a repeated prayer. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day, for blessing us and work with you this morning. Keeping us safe. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us safe. And we hope you bring us back safe. And be with me, we pray. Amen. 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 I can pray. The kids start to aim and say, Good job, Amy. Good job, Amy. Quickly, you want to say something? Amen. As you know, the Spanish, our Spanish people go to the back to the end of the morning. I had a wonderful time. If you, you know, this place is, you may not understand fully the language. You can still come early to work. That's what you need to do if you don't have the agency as well. Come and sit in and support. All right? All right? It's amazing to be able to learn. And even able to learn a couple of ways this morning. All right? So you see the president of the house and the world to learn this morning from my son. All right? Quickly, birthday. Anyone celebrate a birthday today? Anyone celebrate a birthday during this week? That used to be done. <laughs> I see you come. I, <laughs> I, I thought it, you know, I thought I did something wrong because you were coming up here. <laughs> ah, my sister, what is this wrong? Anyone else celebrate the birthday this year? Um, any anniversaries this year? Wedding anniversary. All right? We go from Sunday to Saturday. And next week is Sunday to Saturday. All right? So if you're coming up, see, I know we have a special birthday coming up next week. We make sure he's ready. All right? We have a special birthday. So you've got to watch a little bit. All right? For the extension. Maybe you can come up here for the time you can see. You see good day? Say good day. All right. So let us sing one line of May the good Lord bless you. Thank you. 
to this morning for God's sake. We are glory in you, Lord. And we are glory in you, Lord. And we are glory in you,
for a whole bit of him, praise to the Lord in number one. Thank you. 
Happy Sabbath, everybody. So, as I mentioned earlier in my prayer, today is Creation Sabbath. Specifically, within the Adventist world, it's called Creation Sabbath, but uh, we should know that every Sabbath is Creation Sabbath. Why? Okay, well, let's go to Exodus chapter 20 and find out why every Sabbath is Creation Sabbath. Starting with verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why? Because six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Every Sabbath is creation Sabbath. Because the Sabbath commandment reminds us about creation. Now, within the Adventist world, we do actually have a specific Sabbath in the month of October that we dedicate to be Creation Sabbath. But I would like to challenge you today that from now on, every Sabbath in your life, regardless of whether we follow some calendar or not, that every Sabbath should be what? Creation Sabbath. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for your blessing. I ask you for a special anointing upon me, upon the lips of your servant, upon the hearts of your people, upon our minds, upon this place, that the message that we will hear, Lord, will not fall onto rocky or sunny or thorny ground, but it will fall on fertile soil, and it will take root and produce thirtyfold, sixtyfold. And a hundredfold. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, you know, I like to tell stories. Uh, this particular message, a different format of it that's not geared towards creation Sabbath, was uh, I, I gave it down in Burlington um, on, on September 30th. So, the last time I stood at this pulpit was September 23rd. I was doing the second part of my Building a Sustainable Legacy uh, series. So you could call this maybe the third part of the continuation, the sequel, if you want to call it that. Uh, but I wasn't thinking about creation Sabbath. And then I saw a reminder, and as I saw a reminder, I don't remember which day it was, but it was uh, sometimes last week or the week before that. I saw a reminder that October 28th is Creation Sabbath, and I had this thought in my mind. Wow, it would be great to preach a sermon at New Brunswick on Creation Sabbath. I said, let me text Elder Dave, find out who is scheduled or if it's to be moved around. No, it wasn't me. And I said, I had that thought in my mind. I didn't say it out loud. I had that thought in my mind. And not more than 45 seconds later, I get a text message from Moses. And Moses says, Brother, are you able to switch with me for October 28th? Has not been a minute yet. I haven't even finished formulating or pulling out my phone so that I could text Elder Dave. And here's the answer that I was looking for before I asked the question. And I said, oh, this got to happen. This got to happen. So I texted Moses back and I said, uh, bro, can I call you? Because I can't text you my answer. I mean, the answer is yes. I was too excited. But I have to tell you more. So I called him and I told him, you have no idea what just happened. Less than 45 seconds before you texted me, I received this message in my mind of like, I need to preach Creation Sabbath on the 28th. 
And here you are telling me, can you take my spot? And I said, what? You know what? Mm-mm. I just, I just gotta, I just gotta, I just gotta let God do His thing. And uh, you know, now I've learned. I don't, I don't know if you have ever felt cradled by God. Have you ever felt God cradling you, like holding you and cradling you? That was one instance at that time. But this morning, as we were kneeling down, and Elder Dave was kneeling down over there, he prayed about the woman who was trying to touch the hem of his garment. And I was like, how did he read my notes? And I said, oh my goodness, I felt cradled. And you know, I'm excited. You know what? I hope you did not have plans for the Sabbath afternoon, because we're going to be here for God. Oh my goodness, can you feel my excitement? Can you feel my excitement? And we haven't even got to the message yet. Can you feel my excitement? I felt cradled by the Lord right there as we were kneeling down just a few minutes ago. We don't have to tell a story from back then for how God changed my life. No, I felt the cradling of the Lord right here this morning. Right here. And I've got another story for you. Earlier this week, one of my students, uh, his name his name is spelled M A R C O S, Marcos, Marcos, and I asked him for permission to be able to tell you this. M A R C O S, Mar Marcos. Okay, if you put the Spanish, you roll the R, Marcos. Okay. When he came to us as a freshman last year. Uh, he says, um, could you please call me Marcus? Could you please call me Marcus? Because I say, why? He says, well, you know, I, I just prefer Marcus. So I've been calling him Marcus for the past year and some change. But last week, one day, he's walking up the hallway, and I say, how you doing, Marcus? And he said, it's Marcos. With an attitude. And I was like, oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't, don't come at me for calling you what you told me to call you. Do you remember you told me that I should call you Marcus? And he says, yeah, but I like Marcos right now. I like Marcos right now. And, and then, I, I, you know, you've known me. I never let things just go just like that. You know, so you, can't, you have to go a little deep. I said, what, what happened? He's like, I don't know. I said, what changed? I said, I don't know. I think I have an idea what changed, but I'm not going to tell you that part. Um. I think I have an idea, you know, but, 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 but he now likes his name. The name that was given to him, he likes that name. You understand? And so in my mind, because I was, I was already in my mind preparing for today, preparing about creation Sabbath, I thought about it. He likes his name. He likes his name. Come on, Adventists, follow me. He likes his name. Come on, Christians, follow me. He likes his name. What does the name mean in the Bible? The character. It's the character. And guess what? God, God changes our names from time to time because he says, you are no longer going to be Jacob the deceiver. You are no longer, you see how I've, I've connected to the last one? No, I hope you're following. I hope you're following. Stay with me. You are no longer going to be called a liar, a cheater, a deceiver. You are going to be called a prince with God. I like my name. I like my name, the young man said. I like what they called me. I like what they identified me as. And so, you know, because of, because of creation, when God created us, He created us with a certain name. He says, we're going to call him Ish. That means man. And the, the one that derived from him, we're going to call her Isha. I mean, he is from the man. I like them. They are made in my image. That is our character. That is our identity. Today, if you walk around, we're, we're walking in a world where so many people are confused about their identity. And the reason why we're confused about our identity is because we don't know how to do the proper comparison. And if you did not know it, all identity is a comparison. There is no such thing as an innate identity. Everything that we identify is because it was the identity was put in by someone else. Now, if you remember some years back, some of you may remember it, some of you may not remember it, 
I preached on the, I preached a sermon called Identity. It was on a Sabbath. That was the day before the Super Bowl. We talked about mirror neurons. Some of you were too young to remember. Some of you were not even here. I might even have to do this again. But I remember it just as if it was yesterday. The word identity comes from the Latin identidem, which is actually a, a contraction of three words. Idem et idem. Idem means same. So identity means sa- same and same. So if I say I identify with you, are you following? I identify with you, it means I could see myself in you and I could see how you could be represented in me. I identify with you. I see the things in me that are the same in you. And I see the same the things in you that are the same in me. That's how identity is done. So any identity that we could ever have is always a comparison. Understand? So the question is, what are we comparing to? What are we comparing to? So this man, earlier, last year, he did not like his name because maybe other people made him feel that that name was not the best. Maybe he was, he has met people who don't know how to say Marcos, and so they always messed it up. So he got tired of people messing up his name. He says, you know what? Just call me Marcus. I wonder how many of us are changing our name and tweaking it a little bit just so that we could fit into the wor- what the world is able to, to, to withstand. They can't stand who you are for real, so you change yourself a little bit, just ever so little bit, so that you could fit into their mold. Last time I talked about you need to be authentic. You need to be your authentic self, the one that God created. Because if you live your life as your authentic self, the one that God created, your identity is going to be founded on something that is immutable, immovable, unchangeable. Same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And therefore, there's not going to be any confusion. In my chemistry classes, in my physics classes, I talk about the idea of measurement. Measurement is also a comparison. You can never measure anything without comparing it with something else. When you talk about what a centimeter is, what's a centimeter? Somebody decided that this is what a centimeter is, we standardized it. So now imagine four of you decided to go build a house. And each of you is going to build one wall of the house. So let's say one person is going to build this wall, and the other person is going to build that wall, the other person is going to build this wall, and the other person is going to be build the back wall, correct? And we're going to use those old school measurements, like a cubit. A cubit goes from your elbow to the tip of your fingers. So this is a cubit. If I'm going to use my cubit, and you're going to use, a, I'm going to use my cubit to, to measure five cubits, on that wall. That's the height of the wall, correct? And you use your cubit to measure that side, five cubits. We're all dealing with the same number of cubits, correct? To build that wall. And somebody else does their measurement on that side, and they do five cubits to build this wall, and same thing over there. When we're done, those walls are not going to be the same height. And because they're not the same height, we're trying to put on a roof. And that roof is going to be all discombobulated. Because we're using different types of identities that are being changed based on myself. But myself is not a solid foundation to build anything on. Come on now, you know how shifty you are. I know how shifty I am. You know that sometimes you say, you know what? Oh yeah, we're going to hang out at this place at such and such a time. And you know, time comes, you know, this happens to me especially on Sundays. There's certain appointments that I keep on Sundays, and other times I go like, ah, I don't really care about those people that much. It's true. It's true. Happened to me a few weeks ago. I did my morning meeting with my, 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 my two students, and when I finished, there was something that was supposed to happen somewhere else. 
that require for me to get out of my bed and put on a different set of clothes and get out of my house and get into my car and drive certain distance, about 45 minutes. And I calculated all of that in my mind. I'm like, I'm talking about Now, I'm talking about me. I'm not, I don't know about your life, but I know that you're 52. Okay, uh, so think about it. I am not a good foundation for building some kind of identity. So if you're trying to identify with me based on what you see in me, you are sorely mistaken. You need to find a better source, something that does not change. If you're building a house, if you build, you know, when, when they build a house, what they do is uh, the, 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 the civil engineers will come and they will do like a feasibility study. They will study the soil to see how, how much you have to go until you get to bedrock. And then when you get to bedrock, you're going to plant some metal, strong, solid metal pieces into the bedrock. You don't just place them on the bedrock. You, you, you drill them into the bedrock, and then those are going to be the support for your foundation. You haven't even built the foundation yet. Your foundation is going to be based on something more solid than your foundation. So whatever your identity is founded upon, let it be founded on something that is more solid than just your own personal shifty idea of whatever needs to be. Does that make sense? Because then, when the winds come, as they will, when the storms come, as they will, when somebody questions who you are, as they will, you're not going to be shifty. You're not going to find yourself in situations where your whole house gets shifted down the mountain because it was just built on stilts that are built on dirt that is built on nothing. Have you seen those pictures of, uh, you know, landslides and then, you know, houses are just shifting down? So think about your identity as that house. The storms come, and when the storms come, they shift it down. What does all this have to do with creation, John? Well, God created you and I in His image. And He gave us an identity, and He gave us three jobs. Be fruitful and multiply. Eat and do dominate. Those were the three job descriptions for a human being. It says, I give you things to eat, eat of all these things that I've given you except that one tree over there. That's it. And yet, as human beings, what do we do? We always focus on what is lacking more than what is there. All of these people in the church could tell you that you are beautiful. Let one person out there tell you that you're ugly, and who are you going to listen to? Mm -hmm. God could stand and send you prophet after prophet after prophet telling you, I love you, I love you, I love you. He could cradle you like he cradled me this morning and tell you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Some dude out there who doesn't know where they are tells you, I hate you. And that's the only person you're going to focus on. We always focus on what's lacking rather than what is present. We're always looking at the things that other people have that we don't have rather than focusing on the things that we do have. What talents has God given you? What has God built in you that is there for His glory to build other people? And we focus on what other people have. We focus on the things, the house that they have, the money that they have, the car that they have, the job that they have, the, 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 the spouse that they have, the, the, the children that they have, the education that they have, the, the, the vacation that they took, all of that stuff. You're focusing on all of those things, but God is saying, look at the things that are built in you. You are unique and nobody else can do everything that you do. We focus on what is lacking rather than what is there. And then because we focus on what is lacking rather than what is there, we have forgot our, forgotten our heritage. And when we forget our heritage, if you go to Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah chapter 58, the heritage of Jacob. I told you it's a secret. 
And it starts like this. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did not that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of that of their God. They ask me of ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted and you have not seen God? I'm doing all of this for you, God. For you're not paying attention, God. Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? Now, in, in those days, whenever Israel would get a calamity upon them, what they would do is they would tear their clothes. And then they would go and grab some sackcloth. That's like the stuff that we have potatoes in it. That's potato bag. Okay, you know, you ever been in a potato sack race? You know, those things are very painful. They would wear that on their skin to signify that they are mourning and they're living in discomfort. And then when they, when, when they would do that, they would also take ashes and, and put them all over their faces to show that, that they are mourning and that, they're, that, 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 that they are afflicted and something has gone wrong. They would do an outward show of mourning. So now they're saying, because, you know, because it's supposed to be outward, it's supposed to be noticed, that people are supposed to come and say, oh, what happened? What's going on? And then the person would say, Oy vey, you don't understand. All of the things that are going wrong. But now, you have done all of that, and God hasn't come and coddled them and said, Oh, my poor baby, how are you doing? What happened to you? Look, come here, let me kiss it. God didn't do any of that. So now they're, they're upset. They're upset. They're saying, God, we've done all of this and you have not paid attention. This is how God responds. Last part of verse 3. In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit your labor. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with a fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is this a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush? Because, you know, they not only would do that, they would just do this a lot, do this a lot. You know, they would just back and forth, you know, kind of like, oh, I'm dying. Oh, look at me, I've been fasting all day and I have no strength. I'm almost done. But God says, is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? And then he flips the script. Because God always comes to you and he tells you, he calls you out on your nonsense. He calls you out on your nonsense. But then he doesn't leave you there. He says... Is this not the fact I have chosen? To lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring into your home the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh, then, then, if you do all of this, then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. These are military terms. The, the, the one that goes before is called the vanguard. Those are the people that go in front and then make sure that we're protected from the front. The rear guard are the people who stay in the back who are going to protect your back. And you always put the strongest soldiers in the front and the strongest soldiers in the back. And then you have the middle soldiers in the middle, of course. 
Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and He will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and the speaking of wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the street to be dwelt in. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and He will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That is true Sabbath. Sometimes we think of Sabbath as a day to come and say, Oh, oh Lord, I am so afflicted. Lord, look at me, my affliction. Oh, Lord, why have you not heard my, my call? Lord, I have come to church. I came on time, Lord. Come on, son. Lord, I went to the prayer meeting. Lord, you know I showed up and I prayed. Lord, you know I have prayed. You know, Lord, have mercy, Lord. Lord and Jehovah, Lord. Lord God, Lord. Let me not hurt people. This is what God says. You need to fast not just from food. You need to fast from oppression. These are from Isaiah 58. You need to fast from lying. You need to fast from cheating. You need to fast from self-absorption. And you need to fast from causing harm. And whatever you fast from, see, it's not enough for me to have a day of fasting, and then when I finish, I'm thinking about that, 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 that big meal that I left in the fridge. All day long I'm fasting, but I'm thinking about the, about the time when I break that fast, you know. All day long. Why are you laughing? You know what? You know, you know, do you do this too? Do you do this too? All day long you're fasting. And then, boy, should that time of fasting stop. Oh, you're going to stop your face. All day long you've been waiting, you've been thinking about that chicken, you've been thinking about that, 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 that whatever it is that was, in, that was in the fridge, you've been thinking about the pizza, maybe whatever, whatever. We, we, you, you just, oh, you're thinking about it. Oh, I'm fasting, Lord, I'm fasting, but man, oh man. God says, whatever you fast from, give it to somebody else. Whatever you have fasted from, give it to somebody else. If you fast from food, don't just leave the food in your fridge. Sometimes our food is going in bad in the fridge and we have to throw it out. You have too much of it in the pantry. He says, feed the hungry with that same food that you fasted from. Don't just fast from your nice clothes and everything. Take the clothes and, feed, uh, and clothe somebody else who's naked. If you fast from your comfort... Don't just fast from the comfort, and and and, and, and you know. So, so for example, uh, after Yom Kippur, then you have the feast of Sukkot. It's the feast of the, the tabernacle, the feast of the shelters. And so, what what the people were remembering, they're remembering the days of the wilderness. And as they're remembering the days of the wilderness, they still do that. If you look at your neighbors who are Jewish. Uh, they still do that. They, they'll have like a, like a little tabernacle outside of the house. 
So you, you, you're fasting from the comfort so you can remember the, com- the discomfort that you experienced in the days of the wilderness. God is saying it's not enough for you to step outside into this tabernacle, into this sukkah that, that's outside. It's important that you let somebody else experience your same comfort. In fact, you don't have to go outside, simply bring someone in with you. Do you understand? It's not enough to fast for money. Give the money to somebody who needs it. And I love, I love, you know, I actually, I, I rewrote it again. I didn't realize it was in my notes. When, um, when, uh, when, when I think it was Aiden who was, who was preaching and said, let your light so shine that others may see your good works and glorify the Lord. That is a true form of fasting. That is how to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't just this time when, you know, uh, the same way that when we're fasting, you know how we keep the Sabbath, you know how we keep the Sabbath, or keep the Sabbath. You're rushing and you're doing all kinds of crazy things, you know, you're speeding through traffic so that you could get to the store before the sun set. Okay, you haven't done that at all. And then when the sun sets comes, it's kind of like a period of mourning. Oh, I can't do this, and I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this. Again. You're focused on the lack rather than focusing on what is there. Or maybe I should stop saying you. It's not you. It's me. I focus on the lack. And then, oh, it's about to be sundown on Saturday now. And I'm looking, okay, what time is sundown? I check my phone again. Okay, what time is the sun supposed to, the sun supposed to set? Okay, I'm already thinking about the things I'm going to do after sunset. I'm already thinking about how, you know, okay, um, can I start putting on my clothes before sunset so that when the sun sets, I can start getting into car? Is, is, it, is it okay, you know, we're, we're like infringing on the Sabbath because of we looked at the Sabbath as this limit. If there's this hole in our week that we don't know what to do with, we just try to fill it with all kinds of things so that we could keep people busy so that they could forget that they're lacking entertainment. But, but, but imagine if we had to flip it. If we had to flip it. Um, have you ever spent time with somebody that you love, you care about so much, the time becomes immaterial. Your conversation just keeps going on and you have no idea how the time passed and you just keep talking and you don't realize that it's way late at night. It's almost morning the next time. Matter of fact, you probably stayed up. You stayed up the whole night talking. Have you, have you ever had that happen to you? That is true sound. Imagine if you could spend time with God and you're talking with Him and, and you, you don't even realize that the time has gone. That's what used to happen to, 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 to God and Enoch. They used to talk so much and, you know, Enoch said, you know what, uh, why do you live there and I live here? You know, just come and just live with me. That's the kind of Sabbath that we need to have. Imagine if you had that kind of relationship with God. You're spending so much time enjoying what God is doing and what God has done. You feel Him cradling you. You feel Him like, oh, you, just, you, you share jokes. You share all these things. And now, here's the thing that has happened to us. Most of us think that there's actually a separation. There are those things that are secular and there are things that are sacred. And we do a very good job knowing what's secular, what's sacred, and we say don't bring the things that are secular into the sanctuary. But, but I'm going I'm to challenge you to think of Jesus. Jesus didn't have a secular life and a sacred life. He just simply had a life. All of his life was sacred. And by the way, sacred doesn't mean you're sitting in a pew in a church somewhere and you're reading the Bible. That is not what sacred means. Sacred simply means set aside for a special purpose. 
set aside for a special purpose. So, for example, I have this notebook. This is my, my notebook that I put in my sermons. Sometimes my, my to-do, but I, I, I put in my sermons. And, you know, this is set aside for my special purpose. It wouldn't do you any good, and nor would I want you to take my notebook, because now you have taken away my notebook that's set aside for my special purpose. Does that make sense? And then there are also people that you have in your life that are set aside for a special purpose. Like, you do not go and talk about everything with just anybody that you meet. You have a best friend for that. That best friend is set aside for a special purpose. Now, mind you, when you're hanging out with your best friend, you could talk about just about anything, but there are certain things that you're not going to talk about. For example, you know, for those of you that have spouses, if your spouse is not your actual best friend, some people have a some mentalities about that. I'm not going to get into that debate. But, but you do need to have somebody outside of this. That, yeah, anyway, uh, the things that you would share with this other best friend, so let them talk to the guys. Guys understand this one. I don't know about the ladies. Uh, the, the things you would share with your boy, you wouldn't start talking the same things with, uh, with your boy as you would talk with your wife. You wouldn't have that kind of pillow talk with your boy, right? Because that's set aside for a special purpose. And the same thing with your... You guys understand me? Are you with me? Set aside for a special purpose. The same way that you have this relationship with God that is set aside for a special purpose. It's sacred. And so what Jesus did as he walked down the street, as he talked to anyone, as he had a conversation with this person, it was all combined. It was holy all the time. It was all sacred. There was no separation between that which is secular and that which is sacred in the life of Jesus. So, when through Peter, God says, we are God's special people. The word he uses, peculiar. And the word peculiar comes from the days when people own cattle and you brand your cattle. That pecus means the brand that you put on your cattle. That particular cow belongs to me. So when God is saying we are his own people, he has put a brand on us. And that brand is signified and symbolized by the Sabbath. The brand that God has imprinted on us to show, this is my cow. This is my cow. This is my cow. Now, I, 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 I'm not calling you guys cow. I'm just making the comparison. Okay? This is my person. This is my person. This one belongs to me. Stamp, 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 stamp. That's the Sabbath because the Sabbath is the reminder of creation. So if we live our lives through a perpetual Sabbath mentality, we are always thinking of God as the Creator. And so that song that we sang, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation, becomes a regular, constant thinking in our lives. The Sabbath doesn't become a burden. It simply becomes, I'm remembering who I am. I'm remembering why I'm here. I'm remembering who made me. And my identity is reinforced all the time because my identity is, is, is based on who created me, the one who does not change. Same yesterday, today, and for the future. Are you following? So when the Sabbath comes, I don't think of it as, oh, those hours that I can't do anything. Those hours that I have to have on sackcloth and ashes, and I have to just be gone like this all the time, all the time. No. And here's something that happens when you live that kind of life. Let's go to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 7 and chapter 8 are very much the same as Isaiah chapter 58. So Zechariah chapter 7 is like the beginning of Isaiah 58, and Zechariah chapter 8 is like the ending of Isaiah 58. Let me show you what I mean. 
I'm not going to read all of this. I'm just going to read some, some things, and probably you will catch the same themes. Zechariah chapter 7. It begins like this. In the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the nine months, Kislev. When the people sent Sherezer with Regem Melech and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord and ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophet saying, Should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, Say to all these people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month during the seventy years, did you really fast for me? For me? He repeated it. Parents, you know that when you repeat a question, it means something, right? When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words of the Lord, which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets, when Jerusalem and the cities around were inhabited and prosperous, and the south of the lowland were inhabited? Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice. That is a form of fasting. Show mercy and compassion. That's a form of fasting. Everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. That's a form of fasting. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. That's a form of fasting. You see how that's connected to Isaiah 58. But they refused to heed and shrugged their shoulders and stopped their ears so that they could not hear. Yes, they made their hearts like flint, refusing to hear the law and the words of the Lord of hosts which he has sent by his Spirit to the former prophets. Fast forward. And we're going to pick it up from chapter 8, verse 18. So he, he goes through and gives them all these reasons why they should not have done all of these things. And then, like I said, the Lord never leaves you in the slump. He always gives you a solution. Verse 18 of chapter 8 says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fifth, and the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Peoples, Peoples shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before the Lord. And seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many people and strong nations shall come to shall come and seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and pray to before the Lord the Lord God. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men Ten men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Ten people will come to you and say, Let's go to church together. And they will grasp the sleeve. But you know, when I was listening to this sleeve business, this sleeve business, just get... Give me this. I wondered if the word is the same as the word cannot. And I went into the Old Testament and I found that yes, that part is cannot. And what is cannot? Hold on just a second. So, Jewish people are fair short. And the talit, when worn, has 
these corners, and the corners have the tzitzit. But on the corners, they would usually put scriptures. And on the scriptures, which were supposed to be reminders, but it was also believed that if you touch the tzitzit or the kanah, the corner, the wing of the talit, then you would be healed. Did you hear what I said? It was believed that the righteousness of the Talit would extend to the one who touches the corner. And so, in Malachi, it says that the sun of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, in his kanak. So, because they knew this, there was a woman that had an issue of blood for a long time. And she said, I don't need to talk to Jesus. I don't need to even have him touch me. I just know that if I would touch the wing, the hem of his garment, the kanan of his garment, I would be healed. And she had so much faith that if she touched it, she would be healed. And she did touch it, and she was healed. So if you read this again, let's read that again. It says, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, In those days, ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the Tanakh of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, here's the question. Do people in your household know or sure that God is with you? Like, they know for sure that God is with you. They can see Him working in your life. And they're saying, you know what? I'm going to grab onto your hem. I'm going to grab onto the wings of your garment. I'm going to grab onto you as you go to church. Drag me to church if you have to. But I'm holding on because I will not let go because I know that where you're going, you're going to meet with God. And if you meet with God, I know that it's going to transfer to me. Do your children grab onto you and say, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Do your neighbors grab onto you and to your hem of your garment and say, Let us go with you, because we have heard that God is with you. Do your co-workers, do your classmates, the people that you know, do they ask you to pray for them, knowing that when you pray, things happen. That when you pray, the mountains are going to move. When you pray, the cancer is going to go away. When you pray, the, the, the credit card is going to be paid. When you pray, that, that those, those mountains of bills are going to go away. Do they know that God is with you? And the way for them to know that God is with you, it goes back to Isaiah 58. It says, if you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, don't do your own pleasure, your own stuff. Live Sabbath as this perpetual, beautiful date with God and just enjoy the moment to the point that you don't want it to end. And when you do that, God says your healing will come speedily. Your light will shine in the darkness as if it was noonday. He says, I will cause you to ride on the high hills and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob because I love you so much and I want that the things that are with me are going to be with you and the blessing that I'm giving you is going to flow to other people. I want you to be a blessing in the lives of people to the point that they can say, let us go with you because we know that God is with you. And let, let, let people in your life, every time that they're with you, feel that God is cradling them. Let them feel that God is with them. Let them feel that love of God. And you will understand that each of you, 
each of you will have a small little church. Ten people. Ten people will come to you and you and you and you and you. Imagine if the way that we're sitting right here, each of us has ten people grabbing onto us and they're coming with us and saying, I want to be wherever you are because I know that there's going to be some blessing. Amen, church. Were you blessed and formed this morning? You feel better about Sabbath?
Thank you. 